So here's our next video on photosynthesis, and in this video we're going to be looking at the light independent reaction. And this is what I describe as Melvin Calvin's finest hour. So let's have a look at our lesson objectives, our learning objectives for today. We're going to understand how the products of the light dependent reaction from last time help the Calvin cycle. And we're going to have a look at the apparatus that Mel Melvin Calvin used and understand how that allowed him to identify the variety of different intermediate compounds that are produced in the cycle that bears his name. So here's the overview of how the two sides of photosynthesis, that's the light-dependent reaction and the light-independent reaction, interact. So here's our chloroplast, and we can see on the left-hand side we've got the, the thylakoid arranged into stacks of grana. And this is where the light-dependent reactions occur. So let's have some water coming in. So water comes in. We've also got light kicking around as well. This allows the light reactions to occur. And the light reactions produce a bunch of stuff, the waste product of which is oxygen. But that's not the only thing that's produced. We also get, quite usefully, ATP and NADPH, the reduced coenzyme. And these are going to whiz away to the other part of photosynthesis which we're looking at today, which is the light-independent reaction, the reactions that do not require light. And the main part of the light-independent reaction is the Calvin cycle, named for Melvin Calvin who discovered it, or rather sequenced the compounds. And for this we need carbon dioxide. So we need carbon dioxide and the ATP and NADPH from the light-dependent reactions. The Calvin cycle whizzes round and we produce some useful stuff, one of which, or one of the useful things that we produce, is sugar. We also produce ADP and NADP, which are going to whiz back to the light reactions, or the light-dependent reactions, to allow those to continue. So the products from the light-dependent reaction are helping the light-independent reaction, and vice versa. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So the Calvin cycle is going to occur in the stroma, that's the enzyme-filled gooey soup of the chloroplast, and it's an enzyme-controlled process. For each turn of the cycle, we're going to get one carbon yielded, and that is what we use to build up and make and synthesize useful products. And we'll talk about those useful products a little bit later. So our Calvin cycle starts off with a compound called ribulose bisphosphate, which is sometimes abbreviated to RUBP. That's capital R, lowercase u, capital B, capital P. And this is a five carbon compound. And this gets converted into two lots of glycerate 3 phosphate. But we need an extra carbon from somewhere, and that's going to be provided by carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide won't just bind with ribulose bisphosphate, it needs a little bit of help. So to do that we have an enzyme called Rubisco. So Rubisco combines CO2 and ribulose bisphosphate to form a six carbon sugar which then spontaneously splits into two mo molecules of glycerate 3 phosphate, sometimes called G3P. And this glycerate 3 phosphate we're going to want to reduce it. We want to reduce it to something called triose phosphate, but we need a little bit of help with that. We need ATP. ATP is going to provide the energy to do this. We also need NADPH to come in and give us a little bit of reducing power. So that gets converted back to its more oxidized form of NADP. So everything in green is coming from the light-dependent reaction. That's the ATP and the NADPH. And then everything that's blue goes back to the light-dependent reaction. And this forms two molecules of something called triose phosphate. That's three carbon phosphorylated sugar. This is then converted into ribulose bisphosphate to keep the, keep, to keep the cycle going. Sorry about that. Um, but we also get something lost. We get one carbon lost, and this carbon is going to be used to build up, to synthesize, and make useful products. We'll talk a bit more about those in a second. So, not all 
of the carbon from the triose phosphate are going to form ribulose bisphosphate. In fact, one-sixth of those carbons are going on to produce useful products. So to convert G3P, that's glycerate 3-phosphate, to triose phosphate, that's TP, we need two things. ATP, we need to provide the energy for the reaction, and NADPH provides the reducing power. Because as it's going to become oxidized itself, it's going to cause glycerate 3-phosphate to become reduced. So let's have a look at these useful products. So most of the triose phosphate is going to be used to regenerate ribulose bisphosphate, and that allows our cycle to continue. However, we can also produce sugars, like glucose. So that's a sixth carbon sugar, but we only get one carbon kicked off from every carbon cycle. So it requires six turns of the Calvin cycle to produce one molecule of glucose. We can also produce stuff like amino acids, glycerol, which can later be... Uh, turned into lipids, and other such fun things. So for every 12 lots of triose phosphate, 10 effectively will go on to form RUBP to continue the Calvin cycle, and 2 will go on to form the useful products, like your glucose, like your amino acids, like your glycerol. So let's have a little look at what Melvin Calvin used to identify the different compounds in the Calvin cycle. Here's a picture of his apparatus, and we can see a couple of key things on here. We've got some algae suspended in what's called a lollipop piece of glassware. We've got a light source. In fact, we've got two, one over the other side as well. We've got some radioactive carbon in the form of hydrogen carbonate to provide a radioactive source so we can identify different compounds. We've also got a fast-action valve to drop stuff off quickly. And we've got some hot methanol as well. So let's have a look at how and why it works. Well, the hot methanol is there to kill the algae, which stops photosynthesis from occurring. We've also got, and this allows us to separate compounds by chromatography. Radioactive carbon is there to label the different compounds, and it allows our intermediate carbon compounds to be identified. Here is some of the chromatography from Melvin Calvin's experiments. This is a two-way chromatography, so it's rotated 90 degrees before a second lot of chromatography occurs to separate similar compounds out. So the quick action valve is going to allow samples to be removed nice and quickly so we can change the amount of time we let the reactions go for, drop out a load of the algae, kill it, and identify the carbon compounds. And what this allows us to do is change the time and determine which carbon compounds are produced first. So what limits the carbon, the Calvin cycle? What slows it down? Well, it's an enzyme-controlled process, so temperature is obviously going to be a limiting factor. Too low, and the particles don't have enough kinetic energy. Too high, and those enzymes are going to denature. Carbon dioxide concentration is also key here. We need enough carbon dioxide present to allow ribulose bisphosphate to be converted into glycerate 3-phosphate, and we also need the two products of the light-dependent reaction, ATP and NADPH, to convert G3P into triose phosphate. So light intensity doesn't directly limit the Calvin cycle, but without that light, the light-dependent reaction couldn't form the products that Calvin cycle requires, so it could not occur. So light intensity doesn't directly limit the Calvin cycle, so without the products of the light-dependent reaction, the Calvin cycle wouldn't happen. Let's have a look at some further reading. On the left, we've got some excellent notes from A2 Biology 101, and on the right, we have some fantastic video which overviews the whole of photosynthesis by the wonderful Bozeman Science. And let's review all of this in a nice summary. So, the light-independent reaction occurs in the stroma. It's an enzyme-controlled process, and it produces useful substances like sugars and amino acids. ATP and NADPH from the light-dependent reaction are required, and the intermediate compounds of the Calvin cycle were determined by Melvin Calvin using the lolly lollipop apparatus. 
and that's it. Thanks very much. Like, comment, and subscribe.